y'all, my name is Naima. My pronouns are she, they. I'm an activist with Advocates for Youth Muslim Youth Leadership Council, and the work that I focus on is radical liberation through education and creative expression. The Muslim Youth Leadership Council is holding a week of action, and it is called Muslim And, and we are talking about how you can be both in. You can be Muslim and queer, Muslim and countering anti-blackness, and Muslim and living your best lives. So in this conversation, I'll be with my fellow black Muslim, Vanessa. And Vanessa Taylor is a freelance writer. She has been in Teen Vogue, Catapult, and elsewhere. And she will be sharing her knowledge and wisdom with us, talking about black Muslim womanhood and navigating to the nuances of that. I hope you're doing well, sis. Um, it's good to see you. It's good to have this conversation. Um, I know for myself, what I love about being Black and Muslim and being queer is that for me, there's not like this singular experience and that it's so diverse and that people and like Black Muslims can have a voice for themselves and like speak up for themselves and advocate on their behalf and share their narrative because there isn't one narrative. And, you know, I think it's really important for people to reclaim their narrative and for people to speak for themselves and not have like white men and cetera colonialism like come in and swoop in and tell us who we are, what we stand for, and that we are more than our productivity. We are more than our existence. We matter for just being, you know, and that is so important to me. What do you love most about being a black Muslim? Yo, yeah, what I love most about being a black Muslim is that for me, Islam is really closely tied to liberation work um, because I converted to Islam and so for me it's always been a really long process of discovery in some aspects but also I think just reimagining and constantly questioning what Islam can be for me mm. um, and what it's going to actualize in my life but that foundation it has of me looking to convert when I was really deep in organizing and activism and like really hard like on the ground occupations you know direct actions things like that having that foundation for me centers islam and liberation work and i think that's what makes it so important in my life what is anti-blackness and how does it present itself and like in what spaces and like what are the implications of that right uh, so anti-blackness really basic way to you know break it down is just looking at the words itself so anti and black um but it's a particular discrimination against black people and i think it's important for people to be able to articulate that there is something unique within the black experience mm -hmm. and what it means to be black uh particularly in a racialized world and so that doesn't mean race just as in black and white mm -hmm. although that is the binary that we operate with traditionally but it's also looking at how people who are not white still interact with blackness and it's like really crazy to me because like, you know, people love black culture, but when it comes to like actually being black, nobody wants to be black. Nobody wants right. the struggle that comes with it. Right. And that's like so crazy to me. Right, even looking at black Muslims in particular um, and all the things they've done for black culture, you know, black American Muslims and their history and rap and hip hop and, you know, Muslim cool, that whole idea, mm -hmm. Dr. Suad's work. Looking at all of that and seeing how people love to take from Black American Muslims, from Black Muslims, and then deny them access to Islam, I think is really interesting to look at. Um, particularly, again, when we understand that Islam is a religion. And so what you're doing is you're taking from people in this dunya, but you're denying them access to afterlife, essentially, and how incredibly violent that can be and is really. And that's really unfortunate to discuss because, like, when you're like poor in America and you're like also black, like you, it feels like you're like no one is listening to you, like mm -hmm. you don't have a voice. And I know from my experience of growing up in like a lower socioeconomic background, is like this like in, like this relationship with the police and like how they heavily surveillance like my neighborhoods and how it was just like I was scared. I was scared for myself. I was scared for my brothers and sisters. I'm the oldest of seven children. And like we talk about the erasure and when we talk about Islamophobia and like how black Muslims are never talked about is just like focused on South Asia and Arabs and all those things. And I'm just like, that's a disservice. Mm -hmm. It's a disservice to have that conversation if we're not fully portraying the full extent in the bigger picture. Right. Yeah, I think one thing that I really push people to understand, particularly as CBE kind of gets more attention from non-Black Muslim communities because it is branching out more mm -hmm. into those communities, 
is to understand that, again, CVE is taking from surveillance programs that targeted Black activists in the past. So programs like Pro, so the counterintelligence program. Uh, Pro, when it launched, was targeting the nation of Islam, and it was specifically looking for Black Muslims. And so it is not a coincidence that it piloted with Black Muslims, mm -hmm. even if they are not Black American Muslims, right? It is still that link of being Black, ultimately, at the end of the day. Uh, and I think if people ignore that, then they're going to continually be surprised by these entrapment programs and these surveillance programs. So we talked about anti-blackness and, you know, that's so important to talk about. So have you seen any strategies used in the past that can uh, talk about dismantling anti-blackness and addressing it in the community? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. One thing that's important is that people, you know, first step, you have to commit to doing your own research and your own education because it's not going to be on black Muslims to work all of this through with you um, or really any of it. People might be nice enough to do it sometimes, but that's not something that they should feel expected to do. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be really important that non-Black Muslims start out by doing some of their own research, their own um, education work, and interrogating themselves. And that means really sitting down with yourself and taking time to think through just where you stand in all of this. Uh, but in addition, when it comes to larger structures and organizations, Inviting Black Muslim speakers is a good first step, but I want people to look beyond inviting them in as tokens, right? So that means just inviting the one because you need to like check it off the list right. or like focusing on Black History Month. But it means inviting Black Muslims and understanding that that is not a monolithic experience. And so because you have one person, you're not going to have it all. Mm -hmm. Because often when we see people bring in Black Muslim speakers, it is cis het Black Muslim men. And that is not my experience. Right. Um, responsibility to do that. And that's just such a toll and it's very exhausting. But let's be real, not everybody is brave enough to say certain things to my face or mm -hmm. to your face. And so for the things that are being said behind our backs, that is where we need people who want to call themselves accomplices to step forward and to actually say, do something in that moment and confront it. Can we go more in depth about segregation in uh, Muslim spaces and Muslim communities? Have you experienced that? Cool. Yeah, I've absolutely experienced segregation in Muslim communities. Um, in Minneapolis, one of the most distinct forms, I think, was looking at the masjids, not only how they're set up, but just um, the quality of the masjids. The majority of the masjids that were in the city limits, right, were, were primarily Black, exactly, mm -hmm. and Somali. Uh, the messages outside of it, those were where you got to the non-black era messages. Mm -hmm. Those tended to be far nicer. Um, and that again goes into just resources and access and mm -hmm. the ways that class and race are tied together. But I think it's kind of a common thing that you can look around and you can see that typically non-black Muslims are going to have access to different funding, sometimes mm -hmm. more funding than black Muslims do. And that is going to come through in the way that the messages are constructed. Um, and the way that they look. But in addition, just the very fact that we have such a segregation where I can say this is where the black masjids are and this is where the non-black masjids are. Um, the fact that people do not like to pray side by side, they do not pray side by side, you know. We can also look at, I mean, it's not like a big issue for me personally, but just like people not wanting their children to marry somebody who is black mm -hmm. um, because that carries such negative connotations, right? Mm. Not just for kind of like that relationship, but when people think about the future too, and that just the idea of having essentially blackness within your lineage and how frightening that is to people. Um, and then I, I also see it when we talk about education, right? And when we talk about access to education, it's specifically Islamic education. And so when we look at who is able to study right, in these different schools, um, and who was driven out of them. And so the number of Black Muslims I know who did go to Islamic schools growing up, but ultimately were either kicked out, mm -hmm. expelled, or decided not to go, and all of these things occurring because of the anti-Blackness. And so what that means for Black Muslims who are already being denied their place as Muslims, but who are now also being denied access to Islamic education, um, and what that means for how we're going to start looking at Islamic education going into the future. And I think that's so important to talk about because when it comes to like Islamic education, I know for myself it was very limiting and like, you know, being queer and being black mm -hmm. and like being Muslim, I like I know for me if I ever wanted to further my education that it wouldn't be feasible for me and you know, be very unsafe, which is unfortunate. 
And, you know, thinking about, like, mosques and how they're segregated, like, especially when we talk about in terms of, like, femme and trans and, like, non-conforming folks, like, how, like, it's unsafe for us to go to the mosque, which is unfortunate, because of, like, patriarchy and all of those systems that are into play. And, you know, I think it's really, it makes me really sad to hear that. It makes me sad to experience that. And, you know, I think what... I, I want to segue into like what my vision of like uh, what I want the community to look like in terms of like um, dismantling anti-blackness and all those things. Like for me, like I want a place where trans and femme and non-conforming folks are, that are Muslim are safe, that can like have an access to spirituality and religion mm -hmm. and that don't have to fear their lives and like, you know, are credited for the work that they do and have been contributing for so long, you know, and like to just have a familiar connection with people and like not feel like they are less than and infer inferior and subhuman, you know, mm -hmm. we matter because we exist, we are light, we are valid, we are water, you know, right. Yeah, exactly. I know for me, looking into the future, one thing that I really want for Black Muslims is just the ability for Islam to kind of exist, which might be weird to say, right? Like, it very much exists for us, but it's just kind of, we are so disconnected at various levels. I want Islam to be something that I don't feel like I have to justify my participation in, right, to people who might be Black but not Muslim and would ask why I would ever be a part of this religion but also to Muslims who aren't Black who ask why I would ever be a part of this religion. I'm tired of justifying my love for it. Um, and I also want people to start understanding that Islam is something that is always going to be shifting, right? It's always going to be moving. It is not a stagnant thing, right? It is not fixed in place. When I think of Islam, I think of water and I think of things that move within it. Mm. And so I want people to become comfortable with that because I think it is in that, that Black Muslims are really going to be able to fully articulate themselves, but also be able to fully live within that articulation and like really come to love and know themselves. Thank you so much, Vanessa, for sharing your wisdom and your knowledge and taking the time out to have this conversation with me. I think it's so important when we talk about the discussion of anti-Blackness that this is a step in the right direction that you know we can use this as a way to educate ourselves but that there is still more work to be done um we can use this as a resource uh to use on college campuses and uh, muslim student associations as well as black student associations so thank you so much once again to advocates for youth and to vanessa uh, you can you you can find the video in our digital toolkit uh for our week of action muslim and and you can also subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you.